Battling Euroscepticism and the rise of the right, the EU confirms plans to enlarge. EU Council Chief Charles Michel says to prepare for new members by 2030, adding Ukraine and Moldova to a list of potential candidates. But would EU members approve a bigger family? Or could it push some toward the exit doors? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is enlarging the EU. Growing pains in the European Union have been laid bare over the last decade, from Brexit to fallout over immigration policy and penalties for countries violating EU rule of law. Still, states are lining up to join the 27-member bloc, and EU leaders hope to complete another round of expansion within seven years. But do more members equal more prosperity? Or could more opinions bring more gridlock and more Eurosceptics? That debate in a minute, but first, a look at the EU's enlargement plan. Smiling for an EU family photo. After decades together, they're talking again about welcoming new members. Today is a historic day because today the Commission recommends that the Council opens accession negotiations with Ukraine and with Moldova. The Commission also recommends the opening of EU accession negotiations with Bosnia and Herzegovina once the necessary degree of compliance with the membership criteria is achieved. And the Commission recommends that the Council grants Georgia the status of a candidate country on the understanding that certain reform ste steps are taken. But getting 27 members to agree on who gets to join the club next, if anyone, is a challenge all of its own. Enlargement has been arguably the Union's most successful policy, providing the peace and stability it set out to achieve decades ago. But each enlargement brings new neighbors, and with them, new complexities. And the appetite for those may be waning. In the coming months, until the European elections, we will have serious political fights, budget debates in Brussels, and correcting the mistaken promise made by Brussels to start talks with Ukraine about EU membership will also be our task, as Ukraine is light years away from the EU now. In a letter to Charles Michel, Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban demanded a full review of EU policy on Ukraine. He threatened to block all EU aid for Ukraine, as well as the country's future accession to the bloc, unless EU leaders agree to review their entire strategy of support for Kyiv. And the departure of the UK still looms large. It's fueled Euroscepticism and debates on migration policy that throw the very existence of the EU and how it works into question. Still, expansionism is the leadership's stated policy. We know that uh, the enlargement and the prospect of the enlargement is very important because uh, we know that uh, the EU will be safer and more prosperous. The underlining message of all these decisions is that the enlargement is central into the EU policies. So we need to work harder. We need to work harder uh, within the European Union. We need to work harder in the candidate country uh, in order to make this happen. Currently, eight countries are lined up at the door and two others are itching to join the queue. But for how long? EU members have tried to reassure six Balkan countries that the prospect of admission is still a credible one, but the process is slow. Members waiting since their accession over a decade ago to be admitted to the Schengen zone only increases the tension. As nerves fray, some are beginning to wonder. Will and can this family continue to grow? Or are hopeful applicants on a hook that may never be reeled in? So how much does the EU really stand to gain from enlargement? And will it actually happen by that 2030 target laid out by Charles Michel? Well, joining me now to debate that and more are from Riga, Maria Guluveva. She is the former Latvian interior minister and now a distinguished fellow with the Democratic Resilience Program at the Center for European Policy Analysis. Rosa Balfour Hello. joins us from Brussels. She's a European affairs analyst and director at Carnegie Europe. 
And in Warsaw is Dominic Tarzinski, a member of the European Parliament with Poland's Law and Justice Party. Thank you for having me. Thanks all so much for being with me. Rosa, you know what? I'll start with you because I want the layperson here to understand this because over the years, if you're a news consumer, the EU has, hasn't really sounded like the healthiest of families, not least, you know, with Brexit's foundation built on the disadvantages and allowing for what Brexiteers really called uncontrolled immigration. So explain to the layperson why enlarging the EU could be good for the average EU citizen, at least from the perspective of EU leaders right now? Well, historic, I mean, let's not forget, since the very beginning, the EU has always been enlarging. It included, uh, among others, uh, uh, Britain in, 19, in the 1970s, then it had a Mediterranean enlargement in the 1980s, then it had a Big Bang enlargement in the 2000s when um, 12 new countries joined uh, from Central Europe. Um, and Malta and Cyprus. So every enlargement, the EU has become wealthier. It has increased its uh, GDP. Um, the region, the countries that joined became uh, wealthier. Um, the EU has enhanced its security through enlargement and it has deepened its policies. So every time the EU enlarged to a, new, to a group of countries, um, the EU also had to pursue internal reform to, in order to make itself governable. Um, but also in order to uh, have, you know, good uh, procedures to share the um, uh, policies and financing um, of enlargement and the benefits that uh, belonging to the European Union uh, brings. Today, the project is as ambitious as uh, every previous enlargement, if not perhaps more so, because um, there is a war in Ukraine, of course, and Ukraine is the country that um, has, you know, thanks to the war, the EU has actually been um, uh, triggered into action on the enlargement front. Um, um, it will require deep reforms, um, both to make the EU governable, functioning, um, but also to be able to finance uh, the new set of enlargement. Okay. So it will require a lot of reform. Uh, Maria, let me turn to you. I mean, we've heard the numbers, you know, argue that GDP has grown in every European country. Um, though Brexiteers would say that somehow Britons as individuals lost out. But the other main argument is that enlargement is necessary for EU security. Do you, is that true? Please, please help us understand why that is true because some feel it brings insecurity by provoking Russia. And in this case with, with Ukraine and Moldova at the top of the list, will we see all 27 members agree that their security is at stake here and that they should approve new membership? Well, definitely, it is a matter of security because um, for the time being, countries that are between the EU and Russia, such as Moldova or Ukraine, um, they are, in fact, in a kind of grey zone in terms of security policies. They're neither EU nor NATO members at the moment. They, um, they have a very uh, big pressure from Russia in terms of hybrid attacks in all forms and sizes. Um, virtually on, on a weekly or monthly basis. So, uh, and apart from that, of course, Ukraine is experiencing also an all-out war with Russia. So um, there is a difference if these countries become part of the European Union. There is a difference in terms of which security policies apply. Even if they are not uh, members of NATO, it will still mean that they are uh, part of the EU and it's much more serious, you know, to to try to um, act against a member of the European Union. Also for the EU, this means that while, uh, of course, it will take a lot of investment to help those countries to get economically on par with the other members, it will also mean uh, many opportunities, including the labor market mobility with lots of people living in Ukraine and also in Moldova, and some of them are already in Europe and working in Europe. There, it also means very many opportunities in terms of innovations, because, for example, Ukrainian civil society and private sector is very innovative, and there are many great ideas developed there. Okay, let me ask Dominic if, if you're on the same page there, and if you think most Europeans, especially where you are in, in Poland, in Central and Eastern Europe, actually appreciate what has been called the advantages in this case, greater security, uh, labor market mobility, for example, do you think it's appreciated and that it should be worked toward? Well, it is, but I, I can't understand what uh, enlargement has to do with security. Uh, EU is not NATO. 
Uh, not even that. As you know, last week, uh, Parliament approved uh, changes in treaties. And one, one of the changes is to get rid of NATO in uh, EU, push out Americans out of EU. So I can't see the parallel and I can't see the reason why we can call a larger EU safer EU. You have to remember that leaders like Germany do not pay 2% for NATO. They send 5,000 helmets to Ukraine as a joke. So when we talk about security, what kind of security you mean? Uh, coming to GDP, Poland has the highest growth. I cannot say that whole countries grew. It's not true. Germany is down. And you have to remember that official data by Eurostat saying that they are on the edge of re recession. So, yes, bigger family, a safer family, healthier family, and happier family. The problem starts when your uncle is be becoming aggressive. What I mean is, when new treaty changes came last week to the parliament, we found out that EU is planning to change the uh, composition of the European Commission, cut the numbers from 27 commission commissioners to 15. So the old union would have more power and countries like Poland and others will not have their representative in the European Commission. Okay. So the problem is that there is eight countries waiting for, uh, for, for becoming an EU state member. Turkey waiting since 1999. What about Macedonia, the way they were treated? Yeah, by I mean, Dominic, you're covering a lot there. I, I just want to pick up on, on some points before we go too far, because I would like to cover everything, but one at a time, really. Uh, just quickly, Dominic, I, I want to be clear, when you hear EU enlargement proponents argue the security angle, uh, you don't see the rationale there. I mean, do you actually think that in, in some cases it makes, it puts the EU in a more precarious situation? Because it does. No, what, no? I, what, I, what I think in theory, what we hear, as I said, bigger family is safer family, healthier family, happier family. Obviously, bigger EU is a, a, is a bigger uh, market player on the world, and that's good. But when, we, when it comes to the practice, uh, political decisions with, within the European Commission, uh, that's a bit of a problem. The problem is okay. that theory doesn't come with the practice. As I mm. said, that it would be great to have a bigger union, but how come you want to be safer and do not pay 2% for NATO? I mean, Germany, how would you answer that? Okay, I'll tell you what, uh, Rosa, if I can come back to you, and, and I, I'd like to take a slightly closer look at Ukraine, because that is one of the more contentious countries right now, uh, but it's one we've heard more enthusiasm for, uh, from leaders like Ursula von der Leyen, for example, but it is a country that is currently at war with one of what Europe would consider as its biggest enemy at present. So what would Ukraine joining really contribute to the EU? And we also have to take in consideration, Dominic, I can come back to you later on this one too, the fact that Poland is already angry by the fact that uh, Ukraine's agricultural exports have been uh, negatively affecting Poland's uh, agricultural sector. And it's not even a member yet. Just to say, it's not that Ukraine is at war. Ukraine has been invaded by Russia, so the Ukraine is trying to defend itself. I just wanted to make that um, uh, clear. Also, on the security front, um, of course, NATO is the main uh, security provider in Europe. Uh, the EU plays a role, nonetheless, on all matters that pertain to softer uh, elements of security. Um, and Poland has gained enormously from EU membership alongside NATO membership. Um, with respect to Ukraine, um, the um, Ukraine is uh, defending itself and it is pursuing reforms so that it can prepare itself to join the European Union. Uh, nobody is expecting Ukraine to join the day after tomorrow. The decisions uh, that need to be taken in December are with respect to starting the negotiations for Ukraine to join the European Union. So by the time these negotiations uh, are, are concluded, the expectation is that there will be some kind of conclusion to this war um, that will enable uh, Ukraine to join, um, hopefully, uh, as you know, uh, with its full territorial uh, sovereignty. Uh, so that is, of course, the optimistic uh, scenario. 
The process will be long and it, um, it means that things can change on the ground and I think we need, to, we need to keep that in mind. So the important thing is really to focus on the direction um, of, of travel. Um, another point that I'd like to raise is that Ukraine, while defending itself, is actually working very hard on the various elements that are required um, in order to join the European Union, in particular corruption. The EU is um, very concerned about, has always been very concerned about the level of corruption in Ukraine, and this government is actually trying to tackle that um, quite systematically, despite the fact that it is um, fighting off the Russian um, invasion. Okay, uh, let me come to um, to Maria again because we have to really talk about the Euro skeptics across the continent. Um, I, I know they might not constitute a majority necessarily, but they are there and they are very loud. They are very loud, and I think that's that's the biggest problem. So, if we ask the question, how much EU enlargement, even the the talk of it, actually inspired the Brexiteers and, and took the UK out of the EU. How much should we fear that happening again with talk about countries that still uh, are much poorer, not least Ukraine and, and Moldova? How much might that spook the other Eurosceptics across the continent? Well, for the time being, I do not see the Eurosceptics being particularly uh caring particularly much about the enlargement topic. What they do care about is migration. And of course, by that, they primarily mean migration from countries outside the European continent. So I would say that at the moment, enlargement is certainly not at the top of the agenda for Eurosceptic people in Europe. Um, however, we might indeed see in the future such trends if our governments are not careful enough to uh, frame what is actually at stake for us, for us as member states, for Europe as such, when we are speaking about alternatives to enlargement? Because an alternative to enlargement is basically doing nothing, doing nothing about the grey zones, which Russia will continue trying to influence and manipulate. And it also means doing nothing about the fact that um, Europe will lose its role as a geopolitical player as soon as it stops being dynamic. As soon as it keeps the status quo and stops doing anything to actually uh, expand its influence through peaceful means in the world, it will, in a way, become less relevant. Many players in the global south already see Europe as less relevant. Also, I do not quite see that citizens in Europe, at least in the biggest countries of Europe, including Poland, by the way, are particularly... Um, skeptical about helping other countries. Uh, from the European Council of Foreign Relations survey, which was in February this year, we see that uh, citizens of big European countries, such as Germany, France, Spain, but also Poland, they are uh, quite keen to support Ukraine. What about they Hungary? Not... Well, Hungary is the outlier here, definitely, but that's not because of, of some particular inherent feature of the Hungarian people. It's because of the way uh, Viktor Orban's uh, government has for many years framed all discussion in Hungary in terms of it's Hungary first and nothing else matters. Maybe downplaying the fact that also for Hungary, long-term prosperity is not feasible without a prospering Europe in today's world. Mm. Uh, th let me ask Dominic then about the Hungary angle, because many do pool Hungary and Poland uh, into the same space. And then saying, okay, perhaps you don't agree, though. I can see that. No. But, uh, well, well, then tell us what, if you think the Eurosceptics, I'll ask you the same question that I put to Maria. I mean, if they are in Poland, you know that. Um, of how... course, I've been called Eurosceptic. I've been called Eurosceptic many times. Right. So, I mean, do you think they're going to, this will fuel their fire, looking at the enlargement to countries that Poland in particular has had the issue with Ukraine, being able to bring its agricultural products uh, into the European Union and its cost Polish farmers, some argue, uh, as well as uh, poor... It might. Go ahead. Yes, I mean, it, it... some polls really seem to think that, you know, the EU's gain with enlargement could be their loss. It might be a spark for protests or uh, unrest on, on this matter, but I do agree it's not, it's not number one on our agenda. Um, in European Parliament or, or in Poland. It is a very important subject. You have to remember that agriculture is, is main problem uh, with Ukraine. As you know, 
our standards in EU are so high when you produce uh, food and then you, you you are open for for the products from Ukraine without any or much lower standards and lower price. So you have to remember that Ukraine is a huge country with a lot of beautiful land, very good land, but the, the production is not that good uh, uh, when it comes to the quality. So agriculture, it, it is uh, a problem, but um, you mentioned uh, uh, dynamics, uh, that the EU should be dynamic. I can't see this dynamic in, in, uh, in EU. Um, I remember when COVID uh, attacked, I remember how EU re reacted. You know how they reacted? I'll give you an example as an MEP. They put the posters how to wash their hands, but there was no hot water in a tap. They had a break, they, had a, they, 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 they couldn't fix it, and there's no hot water in the building till now. So that's just every life, every day example from life and when it comes to dynamic. Why, why Turkey is not a member? Uh, they, they have um, candidate status since 1999. Mm. The way Macedonia was treated is a joke. So uh, I don't think this goal 230 will be will be achieved uh, as the European Union is so slow with all these offices, all this administration. I don't believe that. It, uh, the enlargement is a, is a good idea. Uh, it, it's good uh, for the uh, for the union. But it comes with the problems which are not solved by the Commission, and that is the problem. The idea itself is good, as I said, bigger mm -hmm. family is a happier family. But you have to know how to do it. I don't think uh, present Commission uh, is aware of all the problems and ready to solve them. Okay, Rosa. I mean, is that a fair critique? And that uh, we should be honest. Maybe that 2030 is far too soon a target date uh, to look at actual enlargement. Or do you really believe it's possible? Shana Michel said was that the EU needs to be ready itself mm. by 2030. So it needs to start pursuing reform. It's not necessarily a target date for Ukraine joining or for other countries. Um, it's just trying to set um, a goal for EU internal reform. Um, I disagree. I think, you know, as I said, we should not assume that enlargement takes place as things are now. We have to understand that for enlargement to take place, several reforms need to be carried out. And this process happens in tandem. The reforms that in the candidate countries, the changes so that the candidate countries can be prepared to join the European Union, and the European Union needs to you know, make changes. The, if the common agricultural policy were not reformed before Ukraine joining, the current system would not work. Mm. Therefore, the common agricultural policy needs to be reformed before Ukraine joins. So this okay. process is starting already. Um, 2030 might, may not be a realistic uh, date, but it is a target date for the EU to carry out that internal reform and to start those discussions. And these discussions have already begun. We saw, for instance, uh, the publication of a paper which was um, commissioned by the French and German uh, ministers for uh, Europe, identifying a number of areas. They're just potential ideas. Okay. It, admittedly, they, you know, this conversation needs to be carried out at least with the, the, all the all the member states of the European Union. Um, but it's just the beginning of something. This is the beginning okay. of a process. Dominic, quick, will... quick, quick, final words. You've, you've got a very, very quick final words. Last week, our European Parliament adopted changes in treaties, 267 changes in uh, 65 areas, taking power from uh, EU members. So when we're talking about the changes, the changes are in the wrong direction. Veto will be taken away from the members. Uh, uh, our borders will be uh, taken care of by Brussels. Our army will be uh, taken care of by Brussels. Again, Germany is not paying 2% for NATO. So yes, EU needs changes, but at the moment, these changes are in the wrong direction. Maria, 45 seconds. Are these changes in the wrong direction? Well, the parliament does not make a final decision. We know all that it is the council which does. I think that it is yeah, We started the process. We started the legal process, though, so... 
Yes, well, after a while, I think it is realistic to expect that the reform of the EU will happen, that we will go away from uh, veto in all questions of uh, external and security policy to qualified majority. And I think it would be right for Europe to be able to move quickly in cases like the Ukraine crisis. But of, of course, the member states' opinion will still be highly important. And I don't think that there is a real Yeah, they are very important. Away. That's why they don't have a voice. Come on, please. Okay. We are all equal. If we are all equal, we are family. If we are not, sorry. Okay, that's going to have to be the final word. We're going to have to check in with you uh, as soon as we see this, this process move forward and, and where it's going and how those decisions will actually be made uh, when the final decision comes down. But I'd like to thank all three of my panelists so much for being with us and our viewers, of course, for joining us as well. Remember, you can follow us on X and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.